The Asian Financial Forum 2015 welcomes Paul Krugman. He's Professor of Economics and International Affairs at Princeton University, and thanks very much indeed for joining us today. Looking at the sort of general international economic picture that we see, are you sort of worried, if you like, about an international deflationary cycle coming into play? Is that really what we should be worried about? Very much so. It's, 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 I have this feeling it's this kind of almost vortex of deflation that is sucking down a very large part of the world. And it's, uh, it, you see it from China to Europe. You see, uh, it, not yet in the United States, but you know, it, you wouldn't want to be too confident that we're immune. So yeah, it's quite something. It's, it's utterly, it's the, it's the 1970s upside down, if you like. And so where it comes to uh, the way governments deal with these things, is austerity something that has run its course, is it finished? Well, yes, although it's, we haven't really reversed the austerity that's taken place. And yeah, I mean, looking back, looking from where we are right now, where everyone fears deflation, where interest rates are incredibly low, even in countries with fairly large debts, you have to say, what, what were we doing? What was that about? That looks like a terrible mistake in, in hindsight. You won the Nobel Prize with your new trade theory, and then, of course, there's been the new new trade theory. But what are the sort of comparative advantages that you see around in the world at the moment? First of all, I think there's a lot of reason to think that this great uh, era of hyperglobalization, uh, Arvind Subramanian's term, the, this, this explosion of international trade based upon subdividing the value chain and shifting it out, may have run its course. Not that it's about to go into reverse, but that there may not be a whole lot of additional stuff. So maybe we shouldn't be expecting trade to grow all that fast looking forward. The second is that China is in transition. China was the great low-wage producer. It's not so low-wage anymore. It's, uh, the, the demography means that there's actually a, a, you know, not that much growth, maybe eventually shrinkage in the Chinese labor force. So we're looking at this shift of the low-wage production down the chain, you know, Bangladesh emerging as a, a major competitor in, in apparel, that sort of thing. So it's, it's a shifting center of gravity with, however, the, the growth of Asia, meaning that the centrality of Western and especially U.S. markets is diminishing. So where it comes to China, are you reasonably satisfied with the way in which the Chinese economy is being rebalanced and look towards you know, far more consumerism than, than, uh, you know, than investment and so forth? No, I mean, it's China is, is a very scary prospect. I mean, to put it a little bit simplistically, but I think not too wrong, China is a 50% of GDP investment economy, 30% consumption. Uh, that was sustainable for a while, as long as you could have very rapid growth. But they can't. They're running out of peasants, basically. They can't grow at that pace anymore. And that means they need to reverse those numbers. It's got to be more like a 30% investment, 50% consumption. Are they making rapid progress towards that? No, they're not. That's 20 points of GDP that have got to be shifted around. Can you do that on a rapid basis without a very nasty uh, recession, maybe worse along the way. I, I don't, I, I wouldn't lay odds on it. I think China is, is a very, very worrisome trouble spot for the world. Well, here we are at the Asian Financial Forum 2015, and uh, the theme of this is, you know, regional sustainability in a world of change. So what, what's your take on this sustainability factor? Well, uh, the business as it's being done now, not sustainable. So too much investment, not enough consumption, uh, not enough, uh, not enough uh, diffusing of the benefits of growth to the broader population, which underlies the weakness of, of consumption. So no, th this is, it's a moment of truth, a moment of transition. And it's not a failure of productivity, it's not a failure of economic drive, not a failure of culture, it's a failure of a Chinese economy, or, or it's a perspective failure of a Chinese economy that would was set up in a way that worked as long as you could have 9% growth, but is not going to work as it slows down to a more normal pace. So what are the real positive factors that you see in this part of the world in the Asia Pacific? Uh, is this really the, Asia, the, 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 the place that is going to grow compared to the rest of the world? Oh, well, yes, although we probably want to talk about India, which is also uh, has enormous potential and is realizing some of it. But in the end, getting through this these difficulties which are, are huge but get past it, you still have an enormous population where you have a demonstrated ability to close in on the higher, on the, on the technological frontier, a, a demonstrated ability to do catch up, a demonstrated record that uh, you know, powerful entrepreneurial culture. So all of those reasons do su suggest you know, in the end that uh, 
there are four times as many Chinese as there are Americans. People are pretty much the same. Uh, so in the end, this does become the, probably the heartland of the world economy. Thank you.